This week, President Biden warned that Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans enthralled to him are, quote, determined to destroy democracy, end quote. Now, normally you might think this is hyperbole, but it's not. Donald Trump has tried to overturn an election. He has promised retribution against his enemies if he returns to power. He once mentioned terminating the Constitution, and he's currently calling on Republicans in Congress to shut down the government in order to hobble the investigations against him. But since we've been stewing in this Trumpian political landscape for so long, it is easy for words like threat to democracy to actually lose their meaning. For this existential threat we're living through to become routine and somewhat numbing. Well, my next guest knows very well what happens when democracy is eroded and disinformation is rampant, and she knows how not to let it become routine and numbing. She also lives by an adage that many Americans throw around, that democracy isn't free. The legendary Filipino-American investigative journalist Maria Ressa has been on the front lines of the fight for democracy for decades. At great risk to her own life, she's taken on anti-democratic forces on several fronts, from al-Qaeda terrorists in the aughts to present-day authoritarians, and she's paid for it. In her native country, the Philippines, Ressa has faced trumped-up criminal charges after the news site that she founded, Rappler, published a series of stories exposing government corruption and scrutinized former President Rodrigo Duterte's bloody war on drugs that left thousands dead or disappeared. No trials. It was that coverage of Duterte's regime that helped Ressa win a Nobel Peace Prize in 2021. At one point, she faced as many as 10 arrest warrants at the same time. But just last week, she was acquitted of a contrived tax evasion charge by a court in the Philippines, which is the latest victory, not just for Maria Ressa herself, but for her country's fight for press freedom. And the fight for press freedom is the fight for freedom itself. According to a statement from Rappler, it was the fifth and final tax-related charge against her and the publication. They were acquitted of four similar charges back in January. For more on the global fight to preserve democracy, I am joined in studio by none other than Maria Ressa herself, an award-winning international journalist, the president and CEO of Rappler, the leading digital media and news organization in the Philippines, and the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2021. Maria is the author of the very important book, How to Stand Up to a Dictator, The Fight for Our Future. Maria, what a great honor it is to be here with you. It's mind blowing to listen to you in person, Ali. Thank you for having me. So this is, you and I talked while this was all going on, back before you were a Nobel Prize winner, and it was about disinformation. It was about the fact that we as journalists, um, small or large, are up against an institution, a machinery, uh, an infrastructure of disinformation. Sometimes it's your own government. Uh, sometimes it's other uh, other parties. But this is our problem because now we're dealing with people who fall victim to that. And, and we now have to have a debate within the confines of BS. Well, the, the key part here is that all of us are vulnerable to it, right? And, and the first part is actually the, the social media companies, our first contact with AI that is, has designed the very connections between us to spread lies yes. six times faster than right. facts. That's right. an MIT study, right? So, so that's the first step. The incentive structure is turned upside down. But, you know, listening to you introduce this and how fragile democracy is, it made me remember again... We called it in the in in Rappler death by a thousand cuts. Yeah, because it's the way truth is eroded. It's the way democracy is eroded. If you if lies spread six times faster, those three sentences I've said over and over since 2016, when it was when the weapon was turned against us. If you don't have facts, you can't yeah. have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. You can't have trust without these three. Right. We have no shared reality, yeah. and that's where it begins, right? Like, if if people don't believe you, if they don't believe what I say, right. how can you reach them? So how does that work? Because you just you were here while I was doing that thing about Ron DeSantis saying that he's going to make gas $2 a gallon, and all I wanted to do was explain to people how gas is priced. You can still vote for Ron DeSantis if you want, but you might want to question him about right. this. But that's my audience. They are the same remarkable, loyal people who tune into this show uh, every week. And right? they, but, I mean, there's a whole bunch of people in America who I'm missing with this information. Well, the crazy thing is it's not even what you say. It's not the rational part. It's not the facts that will appeal to them. It depends on how they feel. Yeah. Your loyal audience believes you because 
they feel they can believe you, but if they're cognitive bias, if they've been predisposed, or information warfare. We know in 2016, 126 million Americans were pounded yep. by Russian disinformation, right? And if they believed it, if they were afraid they would lose their jobs, if they were a young white man who's afraid, hmm. he listened to it, it played into his cognitive bias, he won't listen to it. So your my words. logic about how oil prices logic are set versus someone saying, you've been screwed, and I'm going to give you a cheaper price of oil. It's fear, anger, and hate. That was the part of the amygdala that that messaging touched. Yeah. And it becomes almost impossible for rational, for thinking slow, to reach you. Unless there, there's another emotion. And this is something we found in the Philippines when we kind of tried to do a whole-of-society approach. In 2016, I was in Mountain View telling people there that, you know, what's happening to us is coming for you. Yes. And it is so sad to have seen it. And January 6, 2021, to have actually moved faster into violence than in the Philippines, right? So, so yes, it's going to be impossible to reach them. And this is a problem for journalists. Yeah. How do we touch people with facts when it is emotionally, yeah. you know, they're, they're, they're closed being, off to us? Yes, exactly. So I guess there's some empathy discussion there, but there's something else that uh, you and I were talking about. So you, you were the head of an organization that a lot of people in the world didn't know, so many of us did know about it. But it speaks to the idea that there's actually something we can all do. Again, I think most of my viewers always register to vote and go vote. But give me some help for people who are desperate, who think that democracy might be starting to elude us. What can they do? First of all, it isn't out there, this battle. You know, you've done a lot on Ukraine and what, Russia's invasion. And people think, oh, it's this conventional war out there. It isn't. It is personal. Yeah. It is here in your hands. And it is a person to person battle for integrity. It is a battle for values. It is a battle for how you see the world. What can you do? You have to ask yourself the same questions you and I have asked ourselves. For me, it was it became very clear. What am I willing to sacrifice right. for the truth? And I realized and it was potentially your money and your freedom. That's a, mean, that's a big step. I was willing to go to jail for almost 100. Actually, Amal Clooney on, on Christmas Eve tells me it's more than 100 years in right, jail, right. right? So, yeah, I mean, you're forced to So this to isn't a few that. tweets and things like that. You're prepared to say, I will risk my livelihood. And again, I'm not meaning to make weird comparisons, but those are choices that Gandhi made and Martin Luther King made and Nelson Mandela made. They were saying, I'm going to believe in something and it's going to cost me real stuff. It was never that active either. I mean, it was almost like, again, you move step by step by step. As the Duterte administration began to attack us, I live, you live by a set of standards and ethics if you're a professional journalist. And, and what was happening to us, the attacks, the four, 28 cases first, right? They were investigating us all of a sudden out of the blue. And the five tax evasion cases that you talked about, well, six months earlier, we were given a, a prize by the government for being a top corporate taxpayer, right? Reality had no connection to right. the cases against us. Slowly they're going away, but I still have three criminal charges left. So I think the point there is that I just kept walking down this path. And what became clear, and this is what I wrote in the book, right? That it is, a, it's up to you to determine what your world is going to be. Right. And frankly, Americans, you have a ton more um, power than we do because the tipping point. So if you look at VDEM, which is uh, a study that was done in Sweden, last year they said 60% of the world is under autocratic rule. I thought, I mean, that's bad. January this year, it became 72%. I know, this is it. Because I, I, I love that Joe Biden wants it to be otherwise, but he keeps saying democracy is winning, autocracy is losing, and I'm just not sure that's true. Slowly, incrementally, Americans have gained back something, but it is fast. And and when I saw that number in, in January this year, we started counting how many elections. If you don't have integrity of facts, you will not have integrity of elections. Right. We are being insidiously manipulated, which is part of the reason I keep saying, you know, do something about Section 230. And it's even worse yep. with large language models. So with the elections coming up next year, look, you've got Taiwan in January, yep. Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim population in February. You have the EU coming up, maybe Canada, the UK, India, but the in India which started this year. Yep. But, but the critical part for the world is where is the United States going to go? Where is the United and States that is what yeah. every American is going to have to do for us. Well, I can vote, but 
the rest of the world cannot yeah. vote in American They're elections. They're looking to see, and when, we, when I saw Vladimir, Vladimir Zelensky at the UN, I was thinking, he's got his eye on what America decides to do in 2024. The future of his country and the sovereignty of the Ukrainian people have a lot to do with how America votes next November. I would say the way the rest of the world, the way the world will turn. And the critical part for us, I mean, I figured I was going to sleep after 2024 because yeah. we have to keep pushing to get these democratic values, to make them real for everyone, so they vote for it. Yeah. Marisa, Maria, a lot of people have uh, valid beef against uh, media and journalism, but when they do, I'm pointing to you to, <laughs> to hold it up for the rest of us, which you have been doing. Thank you so much. Maria Ressa is the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize winner. She's the CEO and president of Rappler, the leading digital media and news organization in the Philippines, and uh, she is the author of How to Stand Up to a Dictator. All right.